employee's been sold a, a lie. And, and the lie is, is that if you, you know, go to school and get a job and then and, you, know, you, you buy your house and you invest in mutual funds and your, your, you know, life is going to be good. And the reality is, if you do that, you're going to pay very high taxes and um, you're, you, you know, you're going to live a life that barely gets by. <laughs> In the wee hours of the morning, the Senate passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which I, I love these names in Washington, right? Like naming things the opposite maybe of what they do. But I don't want to lead the witness here. Will it actually reduce inflation and help uh, the average American pay less for energy and rent and all of those things? Well, today the stars have aligned because we have an interview with our tax mentor, Tom Wheelwright. He is of the WealthAbility Show and the WealthAbility Network. He also wanted to stop by to tell us about his new book, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy. But it turns out that it just was super lucky timing because we could ask him for context about these things as well as talk about his new book because all of this news sort of does play into what we can do as individuals. So Tom, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be with you guys. Well, it's our honor to have you here, Tom, always. Uh, we learn so much every time we speak with you, and I hope our audience pays deep, deep attention because as we talk about your book in a few minutes, there's a lot here for that can really help the average uh, American and people watching around the world because we have a large international audience as well. But, Tom, we would be remiss if we didn't start and talk about, of course, what happened last night in the Senate when the Senate passed this Inflation Reduction Act. There was a lot of dancing and hoop hoopla. Kamala Harris was the tie-breaking vote. She, I think this is the second most tie-breaking votes from a vice president in U.S. history because this is how tight things are right now. It's a massive multi-billion dollar package, but it's called the Inflation Reduction Act. So, Tom, will it actually reduce inflation and help the average American? Well, that, 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 of course, is doubtful. We actually have uh, dubbed it the Business Disruption Act. So it's, <laughs> Great. <laughs> it's much less inflation reduction as it is business disruption. So um, it's, you know, it's a big give. It's a, it, that, you know, there's really only three aspects to it that, that make any difference. One's the Medicare prescriptions, where um, I think everybody outside of Medicare um, will be paying higher drug prices. And the second one, so that doesn't help inflation. Um, there is actually an import tax. Um, last I read it, unless they changed it, there's an import tax on oil. So I'm not sure how that, if that helps inflation to add taxes <laughs> on imported oil. And uh, uh, we have a minimum tax on um, corporations, big multinational corporations that uh, are in everybody's stock portfolio. So I'm not sure how that helps with inflation. And then the biggest, actually the biggest piece of this uh, legislation that is the least discussed um, is uh, $80 billion pretty much unrestricted to the Internal Revenue Service to add lots of accountants and attorneys to their staff. Yes. So in fact, just this morning, 87,000 IRS is trending on Twitter in the top five <laughs> subjects in the United States because of this bill being uh, about hiring 87,000 new hound dogs. Now on your podcast, you have warned that IRS Commissioner Charles Reddick is a bit of a hound dog and that he wants to make sure that if it were up to him, he would want you to show a receipt for every single deduction down to even the smallest parking garage fee, right? You've warned of this before. So again, I want to say you are right. Um, but the question here is, who are they going after? Because Congress can say, oh, yeah, see, now we're going after the Jeff Bezos. You don't need 87,000 people to go after Jeff Bezos of the world, right? This is really to go after the middle class, if I read it right. Well, I, there's no question. It's the middle class and the upper middle class. It's the small business owner. It's the entrepreneur that gets um, gets the worst of this. Because they say, you know, it says in the bill, well, we're not going to go well after anybody under 400000 And then in the next breath, uh, Commissioner Rettig says, well, we're going to go after partnerships. Well, <laughs> tell me there aren't uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of people who make under 400000 that aren't in partnerships. Um, that, because they are. They're, they're in syndications. They're, you know, they're, they're in syndicated um, 
uh, real estate investments. These are accredited investors. You know, you make um, three, <laughs> you know, you, you make $200,000 a year, you're an accredited investor. So you can invest in private equity. So it, it definitely, it's, it's not what, uh, you know, like you say, whatever the government says it is, it's probably the opposite. We have, we have hundreds of billions of dollars in here for climate change uh, information, uh, uh, all sorts of things in here. Also a, a tax hike, a tax hike on pass through businesses. Um, there's a, there's hikes on fuel, coal. Um, I mean, again, how is this, I just help me. I know you're not an, you're not an economist, but you certainly study the ins and outs of the tax code. So how sure. exactly is this going to lower inflation for the average American? Yeah, I, I, I can't uh, fathom that. Uh, Math frankly. doesn't work I mean, out for you. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm not quite sure how, how it lowers in, inflation, um, especially where if, uh, so some of these provisions for the uh, climate provisions are pretty interesting. If you uh, pay a prevailing labor wage, you get five times the credit. Um, and we all know prevailing labor wages are five times as high as other wages in states like Texas and Arizona, Florida, other non-unionized states. So what happens is, is that if you have to pay a prevailing to get the tax benefit, you have to pay the labor wages. That does mean that there's going to be more um, union wages paid, but that is, of course, that doesn't reduce anybody else's costs. Now, um, a mutual friend of ours who I learned about through your WealthAbility show, Carol Roth, she posted an hour ago on Twitter, remember that the government and the IRS doesn't have a revenue collection problem. They've collected more than $4 trillion last year. They have a spending problem, a power and control complex. Uh, but right now, if you really look at the receipts versus outlays for the last four years, uh, the, the, they're not that short of what they expected and what no. they have collected. No, they're not. And, and if you look at the IRS's own data, about uh, more than half of the cheating that goes on um, happens with um, people in the $100,000 to $200,000 range. I mean, there wow. are small businesses, you know, anybody who comes to your door and say, any contractor says, um, it's $120, but only 100 if you pay me cash. Well, you know why they're doing that, right? They're not yeah. reporting that on their taxes. So um, that's actually a, a major issue for the IRS. That, that, to be clear, the IRS has been underfunded. I mean, they do need some funding. But when you take, here's the interesting part of this allocation. So $3 billion goes to customer service. And so instead of getting 10% of our phone calls answered, we'll get 20% answered. <laughs> Four, yeah. $4 billion. $4 billion goes to technology, which by the way, the technology they're using was um, was first uh, implemented in the 1980s when I was in Washington, D.C. Wow, okay, um, so it's they, time. Then they, get, then they get $28 billion for their regular operations, um, which is to me just, I mean, I don't know what that's going to go to. And then $45 billion for enforcement. So it's that $45 billion. You know, if they were to put $45 billion towards customer service technology, I'd not be saying a word about this bill. I think I would think it would be great. They need better technology. They need they need so much better customer service. Um, they need to be actually, you know, um, reviewing returns, letting you get your refunds back and instead of taking six months to a year and a half to get a refund. And so they, they need to step up their customer service for sure. The, the challenge is that's not their focus. Their fo and, and the biggest concern here, Natalie, um, is that um, the IRS has taken this approach over the last few years that if they don't like a deduction or if they don't like a tax benefit, they just disallow it. They don't give you a chance to argue it. They don't, it doesn't matter if it's legitimate or, or that it's in the law, they just throw it out and then you have to take them to court. Well, it costs about a million dollars to go to court with the IRS. And so what's really, what's, what, the fear is, and this is, I think, a legitimate fear based on what we've seen over the last few years, the, the fear is, is that they'll come into you and they'll say, we don't like your, I don't know, credit that you took for sending your child to college. We don't like the credit you took for your adoption expenses. We don't like the um, deduction you took for your home mortgage. And by the way, if you want to fight this, that's fine, but you have to take it to court. And so what's what the, the concern is that now you have a bully with unlimited resources. And that's always a, a bit, I think, I think that's always a bit scary. 
Tom, I want to ask you about inflation. We see the Biden White House uh, trying to tell us over and over again that the government uh, printing of money, this endless printing of money is not related at all to the current inflationary period that we have. Listen to President Biden explain this. So I'm sick of this stuff. We have to talk about it because the American people think the reason for inflation is government spending more money. Simply not true. Okay, so there's President Biden saying, I'm sick of this. The American people think the inflation is government spending. It's not. He's basically saying it's something else. We're, you and every economist and tax expert on your show dispel this notion. So, so can you just comment on that once and for all? Government spending, is it related to inflation? Look, look, just look up the definition of inflation and what causes inflation. It's too much money chasing too few goods. So uh, do we have some supply chain interruption? No question. Is that, part of the, is that part of the inflation? There's no question. But it's too much money chasing too few goods. It's not just too few goods. It's too much money. And there's an enormous amount of money in the economy, just an enormous amount. Um, and it started, frankly, it didn't start with the Democrats. It started with the Republicans um, in 2020. They started just pushing all of this money into the economy uh, over COVID. So we got those, the big, the big uh, CARES Act, and then we got the next one, then the next one. And then I, I actually think that the tipping point was this American Rescue Plan, this $2 trillion that was put into the economy when the economy didn't need it. And that was back in uh, just a year ago. And I, I think that was, uh, to me, that was tipping point. Now, Again, the Democrats didn't start this. This was started under the Trump administration. Um, yeah. But this is uh, the, the reality is that this is what's going on. You mentioned on your show that, you know, it wasn't means tested. So plenty of people who didn't need it got stimulus that they, you know, were not hurting for. Um, and that you thought that probably this was sort of a race to the election, like who could up their ante in order to get elected. And uh, you warned us that, you know, if Trump were to win re-election, taxes would probably not be going up. And if Biden won, taxes would definitely not go down. And so that's exactly what we're going to see, maybe not in terms of individual taxes, but these expenses that now will be put on all of us. But you say you wrote this book, um, and I want to circle around to your book, because you said you wanted to disrupt the way people think about the relationship between governments and taxpayers and then just this morning, I was watching this sort of fallout on Twitter of Ted Cruz saying we should abolish the IRS. Madam President, there are, there are a lot of bad things in this bill, but few are worse than the proposal by Democrats in this bill to double the size of the IRS and create 87,000 new IRS agents. I guarantee you, citizens in every one of our states, if you ask them what do they want, they don't want 87,000 new IRS agents, and they're not being created to audit billionaires or giant corporations. They're being created to audit you. Uh, the, the House Ways and Means Committee, the minority, has put out an estimate that under this bill, there will be 1.2 million new audits per, per year, with over 700,000 of those new audits falling on taxpayers making $75,000 or less. I believe personally we should abolish the IRS, but at a minimum we shouldn't make the IRS larger than the Pentagon, the State Department, the FBI, and the Border Patrol all combined. That's what the Democrats are proposing here. It is a terrible idea. If you don't want 87,000 new IRS agents, vote yes. Which maybe is political posturing, but if you look at the responses, they are very much in line with the notion that you wanted to dispel. So I just sort of clipped one. This lady named Patricia Hughes, she says, yeah, Ted, you're out here stumping for your corporate overlords. Maybe if you just don't cheat on your taxes, you'll be fine. She says, I've never been audited, but then I pay my taxes. Those of us who pay are done with the richest companies paying nothing. So it's this attitude of like, it's the wealthy people that are the drain on our society, right? Can you tell us a bit about what you observe about this attitude and why you decided to work against it? Well, it, yeah, there's there's a, there's a battle going on right now, and our friend, mutual friend Carol Roth, is right in the middle of that battle, which is um, who who actually produces um, all of the goods and services? Is it the workers or is it the entrepreneurs? 
And an entrepreneur would tell you it's a combination of workers and entrepreneurs. And there are certain people uh, in this administration, for sure, who believe it's all about the workers. And what what's ironic is, so look at this tax bill, look at this Inflation Reduction Act, and all the government's doing is providing more incentives. Um, right before the Inflation Reduction Act was the uh, semiconductor bill, which provides huge tax incentives to the semiconductor industry to manufacture in the US, um, and particularly with union labor. Uh, the, then there's huge um, the benefits in this bill for solar and other renewable energy, particularly for those who use union labor. So this is that I, I actually think these are labor bills. I, I think that's what they are. And you know, I'm not. You know, I I love. I mean, one of my one of my goals when I started my first business was I wanted people to love coming to work. So you know, that to me, that's the big question. And then when you look at the tax law, you go, wait a minute. All you're doing, the reason the wealthy don't pay tax is because they're doing what the government wants them to do. Right. That's all. And so, I mean, this is something that I learned from your first book, um, uh, Tax Free Wealth, was that, you know, when the average person makes $10, they pay taxes on that $10. But the government will tax the uh, a corporation on that $10 only based on the profit. So if they spent $5 to make $10, their tax is on the $5, right? And individuals don't understand that difference and that the corporation is just doing what the government wants it to do. And so there's a disconnect with the way the tax law is written, which is to get you to have a business and spend money. And what Congress says, which is they just want to string up the wealthy, right? There's like, there's a disconnect between the law and the posturing. There's a huge disconnect, Natalie. Um, right now, you've got all this, we'll tax the rich. Well, the rich pay, actually, if you look at the numbers, the rich actually pay most of the taxes. So it's it's pretty hard to say that the, the rich aren't paying taxes. Are there wealthy people who don't pay taxes? Absolutely. I have many clients. And um, the reason they don't pay taxes because I look at it is because they're, um, they're actually very generous in what they do. So for example, if you build, if, if you buy a house or build a house for yourself, you get a small tax deduction. You built it for yourself and your family. The government's happy for you to do that, right? The government doesn't give you that same tax benefit if you rent a house, only if you build or buy the house. On the flip side of that, if you build houses or uh, buy houses for other people that you rent to other families, then you get huge tax deductions. And this isn't just true in the US. We studied 15 countries um, around the world when we wrote the win-win wealth strategy, seven investments the government will pay you to make so that everybody understands that this is not a US phenomenon. This is something the governments around the world since really since the 1960s with JFK have learned that people don't like paying taxes and a little tax incentive will go a long way. Right. As you mentioned in your book, to accomplish these five goals of government, that government can't like, you know, feed you, give you a job, all of these things that is the government's main concern. But if it, if private businesses can, right, then they're accomplishing that through tax incentives. So um, yeah, that's in the beginning and, of the book. And, and it's much cheaper for the government to use tax incentives than it is for the government to do the work themselves. I mean, imagine how many people do you know whose goal in life is to live in government housing? Uh, I don't think, I don't, I've never yeah. heard of anybody that says, ooh, I can't wait, I want government housing. And so what the governments do is they give tax incentives to private investors to say, look, if you build your wealth by building housing for other people, we will lower your taxes in exchange. We'll take on part of the burden of that risk that you're taking on when you build that housing. The same is true with energy. The same is true with agriculture. The same is true with jobs and technology. Those things all are things that, I don't think anybody would argument argue that jobs are good. Nobody's gonna argue that uh, technology is good. Nobody's gonna argue that uh, you know producing food is a good idea. And yet here we are saying, yes, but if you get rich off of doing those things, now you're bad. Yeah. Well, when you hear like Elizabeth Warren, we've seen this, and, and maybe this is where I wanna ask you, where did you come up with the idea for the book, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy? Was there, was there a moment you were sitting there drinking a cup of coffee 
And you said, that's it. I've got to ring in on this. I am just sick and tired of hearing these politicians talk this way. We've heard Elizabeth Warren battling, of course, against Jeff Bezos and Amazon. Elon Musk. Elon Musk right there. Of course, the poster child for like the attacks of Washington. What was the moment for you when you said, that's enough? You know, during the 2020 election, there was uh, the New York Times got a hold of uh, Donald Trump's tax returns, right? And they said, yeah. well, gee, he didn't pay taxes for 10 years. And uh, out of that 15 and two out of the, the other, another two out of the 15 only pay $750. And, you know, and so I just did a, I did a little um, TikTok video that went in, instantly viral on why Donald Trump doesn't pay, didn't, didn't pay taxes. And it, you know, it's, it's just disconcerting to me that entrepreneurs and um, again, um, this is an attack that's been going on for many years now. The entrepreneurs keep getting thrown under the bus that it's oh, somehow the entrepreneurs are the bad people. And yet what's curious to me is, is that I uh, think about the last two and a half years and where, where would we have been without Amazon? Yeah. Um, it would have been a pretty miserable two and a half years. It wasn't great as it was. Um, and then you think about all the jobs that are created in, these te- in the technology companies, which are getting huge tax benefits at the same time, creating a lot of jobs. Um, it, it's pretty, it, to me, it's just, you know, somebody, somebody had to stand up and say something and, uh, um, my first book, Tax Free Wealth, was, had been popular enough. I thought, well, if anybody's going to do it, somebody's got to do it. It ought to be me. But one of your goals of the book is look, wealthy people are using these tools. You can too, right? So we can be pissed off about it that there's tax incentives like, that you say here governments leverage private enterprises to accomplish their goals. And so you can say, well, the government's too cozy with these big businesses, right? Or you can use these strategies too. To build your own wealth. Yeah, fundamentally, the tax law is fair because the tax law says anybody can use those same laws. You can't say these laws are only applicable to X Y Z company or these these laws are only applicable to you know A B C enterprise. What you have to do in the tax laws under our Equal Protection Act and the Constitution, you have to make them available to everybody. So the the person who uh, buys and rents out a fourplex gets the same tax benefits as the person who builds a 200 unit apartment complex. Uh, The person who uh, starts a side hustle business in their home gets the same tax benefits. In fact, even some more tax benefits than the one who starts uh, a restaurant downtown. Um, So, you know, there are enormous tax benefits available for everybody. And what's really, what I think is so important when you talk about how do people use this is, um, the, you know, I have a fun, couple of fundamental rules. The first is the more money you make, the more tax you pay. That's fundamentally true. Um, however, the more wealth you build, the less tax you pay. So if you actually buying assets, this is rule number one of rich dad, poor dad, right? Uh, if you're actually buying assets to produce, to, to build your wealth, um, cash flowing assets, you'll pay less tax. You'll build more wealth. And you'll have more cash flow and, and, every, and frankly, you'll be more generous because you'll have done a lot of good in the world. Speaking of doing good in the world, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this. On this show, we are staunchly anti-war. I mean, all my days back at Fox News, this is one of the things I stood, out, stood, stood up against was the military industrial complex and the defense budget being as massive as it is and all of this money going around the world to, frankly, kill innocent people. So that is where I put my foot down and I will be happy to be political about it. And I don't really even think it needs to be a political issue. So I don't mean to be a partisan and ask you to be partisan on this issue. But when we think about tax dollars, a huge portion of our U.S. tax dollars going to the military industrial complex, how can the average taxpayer, I mean, maybe you could give us like a psychological treatment here. How can the average taxpayer feel maybe, I don't know, at peace? Like how do you stomach it when you do have to pay your tax? It's so hard when I, you know, you pay that tax bill and you're like, here you go, another howitzer. Yeah, here you go. Here you go, Zelensky. Well, you know, um, taxes are the price we pay for our living in our society. I mean, that, that's that been established for many years. What's curious to me, though, is that, you know, when the income tax, um, the 16th Amendment uh, was passed uh, back in the early 1900s, the original income tax was 7%, and it was only on people who made today the equivalent today of $7.5 million a year. 
So people voted that um, amendment in thinking it would never hit them. And it wasn't even until 1944 that employees were taxed at all. And even after 1944, there was another 15, 20 years when the standard deduction was so big that the average employee still didn't pay any tax. Now it's completely flipped. So um, I, I don't know how employees can feel good about it. I mean, this is, this is really the challenge is that employees been sold a, a lie. And, and the lie is, is that if you, you know, go to school and get a job and then you, know, you, you buy your house and you invest in mutual funds and your, your, you know, life is going to be good. And the reality is if you do that, you're going to pay very high taxes and um, you're, you, you know, you're going to live a life that barely gets by. Whereas if you take the opposite approach um, and you say, well, look, I'm going to go out and find a problem and solve it. And, uh, and what, I, what I write in my um, book, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, is find a problem that the government thinks is a problem, like jobs, like technology. Find one that they think is, and then you can help solve a problem in one of those areas, and you will pay very few taxes, and then you don't have to worry. <laughs> now you're less concerned. See, really what you're doing, is you're, uh, Clayton, is you're taking control. You're able to dictate what happens to the government's money. Um, the way you do that is you go do those things that they've incentivized, you pay little or no tax, and you get to put that money where you think it'll go, whether it's housing, like you guys talk a lot about housing, whether it's housing, whether it's energy, um, whether it's uh, jobs, which is I'm, uh, you know, uh, big into business, and it, it doesn't matter where, you know, but the more you do of that, the less tax you'll pay, and then you don't have to worry so much about the, what the government's doing with it. Yeah. Well said. Well, the book, everyone, is called The Win-Win Wealth Strategy. Um, I would encourage you all to go pick it up right now. We'll have a link in the description below for you to go to buy the book right now. You can also, while you're there, pick up one of the must-reads in our family as well. Your other book, Tax-Free Wealth, you've got to read that. That's the book that set us on this journey to become friends with Tom in the first place. Um, so uh, I would encourage you all to do that. Be sure to also check out Tom's great podcast, The Wealth Ability Podcast, where he just drops truth bombs and knowledge uh, all over the place. Um, did we miss anything, Tom? Uh, you know what? I, I think you got the highlights of it. Um, you know, the, I, I would just remind everybody that uh, <laughs> when the government says something, you know, you don't like where your taxes go because you don't think you're comfortable with where your taxes are going. Are you comfortable that the government is telling you that, you know, what, how it really is and maybe look at what actually happens um, and look at what you can do about it. I, I love what you're doing here, you guys, because you're talking about what can people do, not, not, not just a, a diatribe, but what can people do about their lives to take control of it. And taxes are a big part of it. So take control of your taxes. Yeah, great. Well, congratulations on the book. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, when we get confused about another tax bill, we <laughs> might call you right back up. That's right. Always here for you. Thank you, Tom. And uh, we, yes, and we want to say thank you to all of you for subscribing to the channel. Make sure you please subscribe. It's very easy to do. It's free. And we have our redacted.inc newsletter. If you go to redacted.inc, it's delivered to your inbox first thing in the morning. Uh, totally free. I would encourage you all to download and subscribe. And we will see you back here tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern time on Redacted. Bye, everyone. Bye, then.